But you might say inevitably, you say, okay, well, you know, some of the suffering in this world is self-inflicted. Some of it's inflicted by others. Some of it's inflicted by the devil. Some of it's caused by God. But you say, but God has the power to stop this suffering. So people would say, well, ultimately, and I believe it, ultimately God can be held responsible, you can say, for why he allows it to happen because God has the power to prevent it but for whatever reason, he doesn't prevent it. So this is what we want to understand. If God is ultimately responsible, but he's not the cause of why it happens, um, why then does God not prevent the suffering? Why, why doesn't God prevent the suffering? Well, the answer is very simple. It's because suffering makes us better people. And for those of us who have gone through, through suffering in our life, we know that when we go through hard times, we become better people, don't we? If we work through that, uh, we, we will grow in the sort of person we are. Uh, look at this verse in Hebrews 2. Verse 9, it says here, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it, be for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing, bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So part of the plan of Jesus Christ was to suffer when he was on this earth because that was part of be, being righteous. Because remember, Christ had to be our righteousness. He had to be perfect. Part of him becoming perfect in that sense was he had to go through the suffering because you know he grew in knowledge, he grew in grace. Part of his being perfect was going through the suffering in order, to, like the Bible says, to make the captain of, it, of our salvation perfect through sufferings. So remember we talked about this presupposition that was false, that God would not allow suffering to his people. Well, it's false because God wants to mold us. He wants to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. So that's why he allows suffering in our lives because he wants to teach people. He wants people to mold. In his, in his infinite wisdom, he knows the best thing for us and sometimes he allows things to happen um, because we're going to grow for it. You know, an illustration would be like as parents. You know, sometimes as parents, we see our kids doing things that are, uh, are not safe or, you know, they might be hurt from it, but you allow them to do it, right? You allow your toddler to stand up under a table and to hit their head. I don't know if you guys do. I do. Like if I see my toddler underneath the table and I know they're about to hit their head, I just let them hit their head because they'll hit their head. It's not going to kill them, but they'll learn that that pain, now they know next time when they're underneath the table not to stand up so quickly because they're going to hit their head. And these kids are smart about that. You know, they can climb on things and they, they can do it safely because we let them when they were young climb on the couch, climb on the chairs, you know, hurt themselves because it makes them grow. It makes them know, you know, where things are. Because if you're constantly modelly coddling your kids and not letting them hurt themselves, keep protecting them, that's what they're going to expect. So when they go out and play with the kids, they'll just run and fall over and hurt themselves and do even more damage if you don't let them go through that suffering and you don't let them uh, experience some of that pain to help them to learn. And, you know, there are so many uh, positive outcomes from suffering. And let's just uh, run through a couple of these real quick. Um, look at this in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It says here, verse 2, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. You know, one thing, one reason why God might allow us to go through suffering is because he want, might want to teach us to value life. I mean, that's why, you know, the Bible says here, it's good to go to the house of mourning. What is the house of mourning? It's like a funeral, right? You're going to the house of mourning where people are mourning and sad over the loss of life. Because it says here, it's better to go to the house of mourning to, the, to, to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. What is that? Death. Death is the end of all men. And look, and the living will lay it to his heart. The living will see death and they will start to think, what is my life about? And isn't that what happens? When somebody passes away in your life, doesn't it make you reflect and think, what am I doing with my life? Because you know, one day I'm going to be in that casket. One day I'm going to be cremated or whatever. I'm going to be this you know, container of ashes. Um, it's so expensive these days to get buried. That's why so many people are cremating. Uh, I had no idea how much funerals costed until I started going to a few of them. 
But you know, you might want to learn the value of life. I mean, when we think about Job, is he, Job said, when he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So part of the reason why God will let us go through suffering is he might want us to grow in our character because he knows when we go through that trial, we're going to come forth as gold. Um, I won't turn to all these passages, but you know, suffering in our life might cause us to look forward to the resurrection. You know, we go through this pain and this suffering in our body. Remember, Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Uh, the, the Bible talks about in Romans 8 about the groaning and travailing of the creation and we wait for wit to wit the adoption, uh, the redemption of our body. So it might make us look forward to the resurrection. Uh, you know, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It talks about the world passing away and the lust thereof. One of the reasons why God might want you to go through suffering is because he doesn't want you to be too attached to this world. Because if life is so great for you and life is so, so smooth sailing for you, you know what it tends to happen generally with people is they stop thinking about the next world. They stop thinking about eternal things because they've got it so great here. They have no need to look forward to something else. God may send some suffering in your life to make you look forward to the resurrection, to make you not so attached to this world. Our God allows you to go through suffering because he wants you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We already talked about this because Jesus was made perfect through suffering. God wants you to go through suffering too to help you to grow and to be conformable unto his death as we read in Philippians. But a few other quick examples of you know, how suffering can be a positive outcome for you. You, know, you might have an undesired outcome to teach you patience. You know, you, you're working hard for something and you don't get it because God wants to teach you some patience and you have to keep working hard at it. Um, maybe a broken promise, right? Somebody fails you. Somebody breaks their promise to you. Maybe a failed marriage to, to help you to trust God. Because maybe you were trusting man. That's where your joy was. And then when you lost that joy, it made you realize, hey, wait a second, I'm not putting my trust on God because God has not failed me. God uh, will never fail me. He'll never leave thee nor forsake me. Uh, what about a disappointment to teach you how to love unconditionally? Because maybe in your life you only love people that love you. But then you're disappointed and God is trying to teach you, hey, you still need to love this person even though they've failed you. Um, to teach you how to love unconditionally. Uh, what about a mistake to teach you how to do it correctly? A failure to teach you how to succeed? You know, what about an uncontrollable situation to teach you to pray? You know, we don't pray, but then God might send something that you have no control over. And then that brings you to your knees and think, oh, please, God, like, do this for me. How many times has that uh, happened in my life where God has brought me to my knees uh, a situation that I couldn't control? Um, what about a failure, right, to teach you consistency, to be consistent in season and out of season? You know, a loss to teach you priorities. Um, you know, a trial. He might send a trial in your life to teach you how to comfort others that go through that same trial, right? Um, and you know, what about the unbeliever? Because, you know, we're talking about believers and bad things happening to believers. But, you know, this is the same reasons can apply of why God allows bad things to happen to unbelievers because he wants to wake them up. You know, just last week, me and Han were talking to this, uh, this lady. And she was talking about, oh, you know, if God is real, why did he allow this to happen to my niece and all these sort of things? And we had this long conversation about all this stuff, and this is why I was thinking about this stuff this week and thought I'd preach on it. You know, we're talking about all these reasons about, you know, some things are not always caused by God. But then my short answer to her was always, you know, well, God allows you to go through suffering because it's going to make you a better person. I said to her, you know, haven't you gone through some hard times and you've become a better person because of that? She's like, yeah. But you know, the funny thing was, at the end of that conversation, I don't know if you remember why, at the end of that conversation, we were sort of saying, well, hey, well, I hope you think about this stuff. Do you, do you ever think about this stuff? Think about God? And she's like, oh, you know, she's like, you know what? No, I don't, I don't have time for God. I don't want to think about God. And, you know, she's just basically saying, oh, you know, I don't want, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't really think about him. And then I just swung it back on her because I was just thinking, well, you know, you are the one asking why God allows suffering to happen in your life. And I was saying to her, well, maybe this is the reason why God has allowed these things to happen in your life, because you have this attitude of not caring about God, not, 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 not even thinking about God. Maybe this is the reason why God allowed, you, you know, the, your niece to experience that and your family to go through these things because it made you wonder about God, didn't it? Because it made, made her think, well, if there's a God out there, why is he allowing these things? Well, it, it, it causes people to seek answers, answers. But I just think it's 
it's, what's the word? Is it ironic that people are asking, you know, why does God allow all these things? And yet the reason why he's allowing it is not waking her up to the fact that this is why he has allowed it.